Um, I'm a grad student here at Texas Tech in the MFA program in photography, but I also have a previous master's degree in English and I've been working in writing centers since 2010. <laughs> That's been a long time now. <laughs> so this is work that I really care a great deal about. So let's talk about synthesis and getting text together. So the first thing you need to know is to be able to write a synthesis, you have to understand summary because they're concepts that build on each other. Um, so we have a lovely contribution from Kevin here. Mini cupcakes is in the mini version of regular cupcakes, which is already a mini version of cake. Honestly, where does it end with you people? And unfortunately in English, a lot of concepts do build on each other. So we have to have a good understanding of them all to be able to produce really thorough and well-documented and clear and concise and you know, an endless list of other wonderful skills we want to see in, in solid writing. So summary and synthesis both contain your words and someone else's ideas. You can't include everything from the original sources. Both can be used to work towards your goals as a writer. Both require you to be fair to your reader and the original creator. So it's important to understand just because an author might say something like how much they love Texas Tech football, it doesn't mean that they hate Texas Tech baseball. So we have to be fair to those things. And we have to keep in mind that our audience might never find out what the original sources actually say. They're putting a great deal of faith in you. Um, obviously you're always choosing to include things that are important to you too. So that's a big part of those decisions you make as a writer um, and in representing these things to your audience. So when we do synthesis, we're relying on a concept called intertextuality, which basically just means we're making texts talk to each other. This can be done for a lot of different purposes in a lot of different ways, but making those conversations happen helps us to understand civil similarities and differences between things. So I'm gonna need a little bit of help on this one. I'm gonna assume some of you have seen um, any of the Marvel movies that have come out recently, and some of you have probably seen a little known show, it's pretty, pretty niche, called The Office. Um, so I'm gonna need a little bit of help here. Who's Toby? Toby's uh, Michael's nemesis, his arch enemy. Okay, who's Michael? Uh, that's Michael Scott, the, the main character from The Office, the manager of uh, Thunder Mifflin. Okay, so we've got a boss, we've got a guy in human resources who he hates. So who's Holly? Holly showed up for a few seasons. She was uh, Michael Scott's big love. She was also an HR person and Toby and Holly were in there at different times, I think. Yeah, so Toby moves to Costa Rica and Holly comes in to replace him. So who's in these pictures? These aren't characters from The Office. That would be the Hulk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so on our left, we have a very angry iteration of the Hulk. And on our right, a very chill intellectual version of the Hulk. So um, in that version on the right, our Hulk has made peace with his anger. He's at his best. He's strong and intelligent. He's bringing those two things together, synthesizing, if you will. <laughs> I know it's a terrible joke. But when we look at this meme, even though it's silly, it's showing us something about how Michael feels about Toby, furious, angry, um, and something about how he feels about Holly. Suddenly he's calm, he's more intelligent, he's more centered. Um, and your brain probably processed that instantly if you have an understanding of these two different properties. We constantly use things one thing to help us understand another thing. We constantly look at things that talk to each other and help us um, to understand those concepts better. Even if we look at dictionary definitions, we're relying on other words to understand an original word. If you look up something like dog in the dictionary, um, I think I wrote down a quote, so brace yourself, a highly variable domestic mammal closely related to the gray wolf. That's what Merriam-Webster says. So we have to know what domestic is. We have to know what a mammal is. We have to know what a gray wolf is to understand that original concept. So those are all different texts, different concepts talking to each other. That all plays into discourse communities, which is how you understand if you're in the know. 
So discourse communities are just groups that share a vocabulary. They share these common words that they use together. They can be big groups like students or small groups like students at Texas Tech or even much, much smaller groups like you and your best friend. Inside jokes are a great example of discourse communities. They depend on particular words or phrases that mean something specific to other people in that group. So let's take a look at what's happening in this meme. What's the top photo from? A yearbook picture. Fantastic. Um, how do you know that? Uh. I had one. <laughs> <laughs> so you're already an expert in a discourse community. You know, just from glancing at this for a few seconds, it's got a plain background, it's got little boxes we can kind of see off to the edge, other little boxes that are probably from photos. They have the same background. So there are all of these clues to someone like our expert here can look at this for just an instant and say, that's from a yearbook. It's even got a little quote under it. It's got the person's name. So fantastic understanding of a discourse community, really good work there. Um, our second picture, really obvious, and you already know what it's from because we're talking about The Office a lot here. But if we look up The Office, season seven, episode 19, minute 14.45, it is Michael Scott saying, should have burned this place down when I had the chance. So part of what discourse communities do is they let other people know that we're part of that group. So when we use academic language, when we show that we deeply understand things by using that language, we're showing we belong to that community. And that's a big part of academia. You need to use the correct terms um, to show that you are a part of things. Um, but the two images also speak to each other. When we have them together, we understand each differently. If we see this first one without understanding which moment in the office it's referring to, she probably likes the office. If she tried to just put, should have burned this place down when I had the chance as her yearbook quote, I have a good feeling she'd be censored. But because of that little bit of distance, using that discourse community, using that specialized language, she got away with something pretty funny. So when we put two things together, they can change those meanings. So juxtaposition is another $5 word, but all it means is putting things next to each other. So the first half of our image reads, being around a fire with friends. And then underneath that, it says, just girly things. So what's going on in this top photo? <laughs> yeah, Savi, you're right. The sheriff would knock on her door in that first one. So um, what's happening in this first photo? What, what does it make you think of? The first one is kind of a feel good, just being around a campfire with your friends, just having a good time. Absolutely. So I'm just taking a quick note on what you're saying in the chat. So it's pretty straightforward. They're having a campfire with friends. It's probably pleasant. It might make you think of friends or fall, relaxing, having s'mores, memories. Um, what about the second photo? Does anyone remember that moment from the office? Yeah, the fire drill. <laughs> <laughs> so it is definitely a fire drill. That's someone trying to crawl out through the ceiling and it doesn't work out and they just fall right through. So we could put that exact same caption on the second photo, being around a fire with friends. And suddenly it has a very different meaning. People are screaming. They're afraid of dying. They're making desperate choices to try and escape. So juxtaposition is very important. When we put things next to each other, maybe quotes, maybe different pieces of evidence from different texts, we're looking at differences and similarities. And the way we know one may expand our knowledge of the other. <clears throat> Tickle in my throat. So, a big difficulty with synthesis, and it probably the most common issue I see when people bring it into the writing center, is that they don't identify who is speaking at a given time. Sometimes we can feel tempted to just talk about the ideas that we've synthesized in our own minds um, and share those from our own perspective without acknowledging where they came from. So in our lovely little um, image from the office, we have two blank sheets of paper 
corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture, and they're the same picture. So when we use someone else's words and ideas, we have to cite them. If we fail to do that, then talking about one author versus another author is just gonna leave our reader guessing. They're gonna be looking at two identical sheets of paper and trying to spot differences. So we have to use those, we call them attributive tags or signal phrases. They're just when we identify who said what that let um, our reader know who we're relying on to get those ideas from. So I could say something like, Hunter argues that throwing tortillas at football games is rude and messy, but Brooks defends the practice as a tradition that promotes unity and shows the crowd is truly the 12th player on the team. So remember to use your tags. So for this last one, um, yes, exactly, Dustin, in the chat. So you've got to identify your speaker, although I would recommend you're not close and personal friends, well, Dustin and I are, but normally you're not close and personal friends with the people who you're summarizing, so make sure to use their last names. Um, so we've got two lovely pieces of writing from Texas Tech graduates. Um, we've got, um, so if you were at the last workshop, you know that we used the journalism questions, um, which are, I'm gonna put them in the chat, who, what, when, <laughs> why, and how. Yes, exactly, Sava. Unless you have Thanksgiving dinner with the author, go ahead and use their last name. So we've got these journalism questions. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. And I've cheated and given you a couple to get started with. So these pieces, the first one is written by Ruben Caseta, and the second is written by Stephen Graham Jones. I gave you even a little bit more information. They both graduated from Texas Tech. So those are things we know about them. I can give you a little bit more. Um, the first one on the left here is a poem, and this one on the right is uh, the first two paragraphs of a short story. So what I'm going to do now is just read these both aloud. And as I read them aloud, um, go ahead and make notes. Make them in the chat, make them in a Word document, make them wherever you feel comfortable about these questions. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why, and how. And we're going to talk about them in a second. So, last photograph of my parents by Ruben Quesada. Tortillas clap against flowered palms. Steaming bowls of avena, frijoles black as the rumbling sky. Arroz con pollo simmers. Against the kitchen window, small clouds rise. Papa dances to the electric beat of the maramba, his cheek bristly against mama's neck. His thick fingers sift through her wispy hair. I am nowhere to be found, neither in the foreground nor background. Today, I sit in this chair in the corner of my house, covered with the poncho of blue flowers, looking out at asphalt roads overflowing with rain, fogging the glass. Along the road, steam rises like blotchy fingerprints. And the next one is an excerpt from Wait for Night by Stephen Graham Jones. It was just a day labor gig. Really, the only reason I'd signed on was because, for insurance reasons, Hiring on meant getting fitted for a brand new pair of lace-up Red Wing boots. It was a new policy that summer. Some punk from a few months before had come back and sued the owners for how his right foot had gotten caught under the tread of a little ditch witch. He'd argued he was going to have a game foot the rest of his life. That would impact future employment, happiness, his dreams of being a kicker for the Broncos, everything to the tune of a few hundred thousand dollars. Before anyone else could eat, ease what they considered their least important foot in the way of any of the equipment. It was new boots all around. Composite toes, ankle support, and all you had to do was to lace those boots on was to sign papers that, since your feet were now protected, you and you alone would be legally liable for them. So, heard both stories. You can feel free to reread them um, as we talk. But let's, let's take those questions and kind of work through this. So who are each of these works about? We don't know their names, but we know some things about them. In that piece by Quesada, what do we know about the speaker? Yeah, so he's a son. He has parents, we hear about them. And what's he doing?
sitting in a chair. Excellent, Gail. And why is he thinking about these things? Yeah, we know that from the title. Excellent work. So he's looking at his parents' photo, the last photograph of my parents. Um, and what is he talking about in general? That's a pretty easy one if you look at just that first stanza. Yeah, he's describing the photo, but he's also remembering, yeah, all of this great imagery. We've got a ton of food that he's describing that sounds, frankly, delicious. Um, the sky is black like the beans, so it sounds like it's stormy. Um, happy memories with his parents. Well, maybe happy. Maybe not. It's a little bit hard to tell here. So that's one of the things that comes in when you as a writer get to analyze things. So you could include proof from this that points to it being happy memories. You could point to his father dancing, um, them holding each other. You could point to all of the beautiful things he's describing and how positive the descriptions of the food are and say, these are happy memories. But you could also argue the opposite. You could say he's sitting in this chair saying he's nowhere to be found neither in the foreground nor the background. You could point to the fact that the weather's bad. You could point to the fact that his description describes steam rising like blotchy fingerprints, which is not something we generally think of as positive. So that gets back to what you choose to include and how it influences how others will understand this piece of writing. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's a wonderful point. He could be lonely and missing his parents. Um, so let's take a look at the second one now. Um, what do we know about our speaker? Who is he? A day laborer. So someone who likes boots or at least wants boots. So we know he cares about good footwear. <laughs> we know he's willing to work um, for not a whole lot of money, day labor gigs, they don't generally come with insurance or big salaries. <laughs> yes, Gail, absolutely, someone with a great sense of humor. Stephen Graham Jones writing is just really funny. He writes a lot of horror stuff too, which is a little intense for me, but it's, it's good. Um, so we have all of these facts about him already. So we've already addressed some of the what in here. He's writing about free boots. Um, he mentions that there was this big lawsuit. Um, he writes a lot about money because really this is all coming back to money, whether it's from the lawsuit or getting free boots rather than just buying boots for yourself. So there's a lot happening there. Um, when is he writing? Do we have any clues to that? Yep, he's using past tense. So we've got a lot of good indications here. Perfect. Um, what time of year is it? It's the baby waking up from his nap. He's with his dad, but life is hard. It is a pandemic. Could be fall. Mm, let's see. So if we take a look in that first paragraph, it says it was new policy that summer. So yeah, it looks like he is talking about summer. But with construction, we typically know it's not going to be winter. So even if we didn't have him coming out and saying that it was summer, we'd have some good clues. So we've got a little who, what um, that we've already taken care of here. Um, let's talk a little bit about where. We get one real clue, aside from, you know, doing some sort of construction gig about where they are. And I'm going to move my cursor over to it. Um, where did the Broncos play? Yeah. <laughs> Denver. OK, so it's not a guarantee that they're there. But if that guy thinks he's going to be a kicker for the Broncos, they're probably in Denver. So we've picked up all of these clues about this information already. So we could look at things that these two authors have in common, which I gave you an easy one, both Texas Tech alumni. We could look at um, things that their two speakers have in common. We could look at um, 
topics that they have in common. So there are all kinds of things that we can talk about that they share. So they're both remembering what sounds like their homes. Mm -hmm. They're both remembering the past. So those in and of themselves could be very successful papers. Look at how they describe the past, how one uses humor, how another uses imagery. So they're maybe using different techniques, but they've got that thing in common that's bringing them together. And if we look at these and about the complex ways we think about the past and the things that stand out to us, um, we get to a really interesting place in synthesizing these two stories. Um, obviously, we've got a much more um, impersonal tone here than we do over here. And we could even look at the difference in the forms, you know, how is it different reading a poem versus reading a short story. Um, obviously, this one is more artistic. We've got structural things like line breaks happening here versus straight paragraphs. So just from a few minutes of looking at these two things, we have tons of information that we could pull from. And it just goes back to those original questions of juxtaposition. You know, the things that we put near each other are going to change and inform each other. They can show difference, they can show similarities, um, and they can expand our knowledge of each other. So absolutely fantastic work today, guys. Um, you did it, the perfect cartwheel. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I have a question for you, Kelsey. Yeah. So you're synthesizing two different sources and you want to make sure your readers know who you're talking about so they don't get confused because I've read the text, but my readers, they haven't, right? So mm -hmm. how do you indicate and make it clear? How do you organize the rest of the paragraph if you're talking about two different texts? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So it's going to come back to this slide that I've pulled back up on the screen. Um, to using those attributive tags, or as they're also known, signal phrases. So if you look at the example, I'm just using author's last names, so I can talk about the differences between them. So I just said, Hunter argues, but Brooks defends. So if we switch down to this one over here in our challenge, I could say something like, uh, Caseta and Jones are both recalling past memories, right? But then I might go on to talk about um, some differences. I could say Caseta focuses on the senses in his description. I could say Graham Jones is more focused on money and how that motivated his actions and the actions of others. Then I could go on to talk about maybe if they're happy or sad memories. Good deal. Glad that made sense. Um, if you ever get stuck and feel like you're saying, Caseta said and Jones said over and over and over again, you can always Google attributive tags or signal phrases or list of and then those um, words, and you'll have a whole ton of different ways. Described, postulated, argued, suggested. There are a bunch of different options. Um, other questions?